yeah, thank you for the audience. Um, thanks that you came. Thanks for the Congress of giving, for giving me the opportunity to be here tonight, to be able to tell you a bit about post-quantum cryptography, a bit about isogenies. I mean, just educate the people a bit about what that means even, because I'm not so sure how many of you heard about that before. Um, yeah, let's just jump right in. So my day job is being a mathematics PhD student at an undisclosed university. You can ask me in private if you're interested. Um, so previously I did physics. I was also, or maybe I'm still a bit active in the console hacking scene. And if you're interested about that, shameless plug, um, you can find us at the uh, Nintem Bros assembly later. You can ask us all about our somehow console hacking endeavors. But enough about that. So um, I brought you some pictures, screenshots of websites. So I don't know if you have seen the chatter on social media and the blog sphere recently about uh, that Google paper on quantum supremacy. So there's a Nature article about that, Beyond Quantum Supremacy. And there is a Verge article that Google confirms quantum supremacy, a breakthrough, whatever that means. There is Google's own blog post about it. Notice there are always these shiny pictures of these huge tubs filled with helium where they house these quantum computers. Um, so supremacy means the state or condition of being superior to all others in authority, power, or status. So calling something quantum supremacy, I mean, that screams of something being pretty amazing. But w what actually does this mean for us? What does it mean for cryptography? And I think I can relieve you all about uh, from, from maybe some fears that you had. Um, for us in practice, maybe today, it doesn't really mean anything yet. So for, for cryptography, none of our underlying assumptions, whatever that means for now, are being actively broken yet, as we know of, or that, that we know of. But in theory, they are broken. Okay, and because they're only broken in theory, it's very good, so we can still blame the designers and the implementers of whatever we cook up for, for when things go wrong, so that's, that's nice too. But, um, as I already wrote in the abstract a bit for this talk, we should be somehow better be safe than sorry. So instead of somehow waiting until the point of where quantum computers somehow become feasible to break our cryptography, we should probably research it today, it's a bit with the climate change, right? Should probably try to save our climate today instead of waiting until it's too late. So we're gonna, we, we want to do the same for, for cryptography. Um, there are also three upcoming talks I wanna advertise here a bit. I think, I, I don't remember the days, but the descriptions look pretty interesting. So I'm gonna leave that up for a few seconds. So there's one on provable insecurity, one called cryptography demystified, and one about high assurance cryptography software, so I'm sure this is gonna be interesting. Okay, let's, let's return back to what I want to talk about. So there's something I jokingly call the post-quantum cryptography zoo. There are a few buzzwords up there, you don't really have to know what they mean. I'm just gonna say them out loud, lattices, codes, multivariate polynomial systems, that's also a bit of a mouthful, um, hash-based cryptography. And there is the one that I wanna briefly talk about tonight, called super singular elliptic curve isogenies. Okay, so this is, this is the stuff that I really like. Isogenies, they're great. And now I'm going to tell you why they're so great. All right, so I, I don't know how many of you have a mathematics background. Maybe I can do a test. Can people raise their hands where, if they have some formal training in say algebra or, yeah, okay. So that's pretty good. So just gonna tell you some, something about it. So there are decimal numbers, this is pi. Then there are rational numbers, somehow they are one half, one third, and so on and so forth. Then there are the integers from minus infinity to plus infinity, and you know they follow nice whole steps. But for working with those numbers and for cryptography, we, we want something that's nicer behaved. We want somehow a finite set, okay? So this is just important for implementation. And the ones that we want to work with, I'm just gonna remind you, are the integers modulo n. So we take some positive integer n, big N, and then you consider the z from zero to n minus one, okay? And these numbers, they follow certain addition and multiplication rules, and it pretty much works like a clock phase, okay? I chose n is 12 here, 
and just bear with me. Imagine my clock face goes from 0 to 11 instead of from 1 to 12, but it's really the same. You know, for example, if I try to add 10 to 5, okay, I start from 10, I go two steps and then I arrive at 0. This is when my clock ticks over, right, like on a real clock. And then you go three more steps. And so 10 plus 5, more 12 is 3. So it's numbers that kind of behave this way. Think of addition on, on a clock face. And for the computer scientists out there, or I mean, everyone probably knows about that. For a computer, there are like the 8-bit integers where n is 2 to the 8, and then these are the numbers from 0 to 255, and so on and so forth. So this, these are the numbers that we want to work with. Just to set the stage a bit. And these isogenies, they will live in a world where we, we work with somehow related numbers to these integers mod n. And now for big N, we choose a prime, P, and then this integers mod P, they represent what we call the finite field with P elements, okay? And you can think of this as a set that has exactly P elements, and it really kind of behaves like the real numbers, okay? You can add numbers, you can subtract numbers, you can divide by everything but zero, okay? And this finite field with P elements works really the same. It's just a finite set, but everything is invertible except zero, okay? And these are the numbers that we're going to work with. And computers can do that, so that's fine. And just for the sake of, of telling you, there are also fields that have somehow p to the r elements. But they are not the same as mod p to the r, OK? But there is a way to construct it, but that's all you need to know about. So this is really the set of numbers that we're going to work over. And that, that's all you need to know. OK, so the cryptographic problem that I want to focus in this talk is Simple key exchange. I'm not going to talk about signatures, not going to talk about encryption, nothing. Let's just focus on this one simple problem of how do Alice and Bob exchange a key without anyone else somehow getting access to that key. And I mean, there are somehow classical solutions to that. I could put my key in a suitcase and I could bring it to Alice, or I could somehow pay someone to bring the suitcase to Alice. Or maybe people heard about that thing where I put my lock on the box and I ship it to Alice and she puts her lock on the box and then she ships it back and I remove my lock, and then I ship it to Alice again. Okay, so there, there are countless ways, but we want to somehow do this in a, in a nice, instantaneous kind of way using mathematics, okay? So this simple problem is what we're going to focus on. And classically, whatever that means for now, this has been solved by Diffie and Hellman, and this is this nice paper from 1979. The title is New Directions in Cryptography. So this already tells you that something important must be going on. And what they somehow invented there was a way to, to exchange keys between two parties using a nice, well-defined problem, okay? And how, how does it work? Okay, I'm just gonna tell you how it works. So there are two parties, Alice and Bob, A and B. They agree on a safe prime modulus n, okay? So this is the integers mod n that we just saw, and the generator g. So what does that mean? Basically, in my set from 0 to n, I want to single out one element such that every element can be written as a power of that element. And somehow this means it generates it, right? So every y can be written as g to the x mod n. OK, this is my setup. And then there is Alice and Bob, and they agree on these two parameters. OK? And now, how do they do the key exchange? So it's very symmetrical. So Alice chooses a random a in the set from 1 to n minus 1. And she sends big A is G to the small a mod N to Bob. And as you might have guessed it, because I said it's symmetrical, Bob does the same. Okay, so how does the picture go? So Alice, on the left, she chooses a random small a, and she sends that big A to Bob. Bob chooses a random small b, he sends that big B to Alice, and then somehow they, now they have to combine this somehow, right? And how did they do this? So. This is nice. They compute the shared KK, the shared key. So Alice takes the B she got from Bob and raises it to the power of her own random secret value. And Bob does the same. And magically, through mathematics, they both get the same small K. And now um, I'm going to tell you why somehow this is hard for anyone else to get the same small K. So now bear with me. I'm going to write it down mathematically, first of all. I want to teach you a bit about that as well. So 
this is this diagram, this commutative diagram somehow that represents this key exchange that just happened. Okay, so Bob and Alice, they both start in the left upper corner with the G, and they both end up in the lower right corner, the G to the AB. So they both are able to somehow compute G to the AB and no one else is. And how does that work? Well, Alice will only compute the horizontal arrows. So she only raises to the power of small a because that's her random secret that only she knows. And Bob only computes the vertical arrows. So he only raises to the power of small b because that's the secret he knows and no one else does. And I mean, by, by the commutativity and associativity of, of exponentiation, they just agree on, on the same g to the ab, which is, which is cool. And somewhere in there, there hides a problem that we like to call the discrete logarithm problem. And it just happens for integers mod n if I choose my n appropriately. I'm not going to tell you how, but just believe me if I choose it appropriately. Um, if I give you y and g, for you it's hard to find the small x. It's somehow like taking a logarithm. And we call it the discrete logarithm because it's a discrete set of numbers instead of the continuous decimal numbers. We, what we started with was this discrete finite set of numbers. And this DLP is hard, okay? This, this is a hard problem for classical computers. And the best classic generic algorithm, I'm not gonna talk about somehow algorithms that specifically target integers mod n. I'm just going to talk about generic algorithms for, for this DLP problem. The best algorithm somehow has runtime square root of big N of the number of elements. And say I chose my n about the size of two to the small n, so n bits, then Solving this takes exponential time in n, right? Because the square root of 2 to the n is still pretty big. Okay, this is about 2 to the n half, and if I make n, I don't know, 1,000, it's still 512 bits. So th this is a hard problem. But recently there has been a record for factoring and, dis and, and DLPing over a 795-bit modulus. And they used a bit, uh, a bit of a better algorithm, but still, it, it, I mean, it still took them a long time, okay? So if I remember correctly, this feed took them 4,000 core years on a 2.1 gigahertz computer. I mean, it's still 4,000 core years. So this is a long time, okay? But as you can see, it's possible to solve this. I mean, if I just put enough, if I have a big enough hammer, I, I can solve this, okay? But again, you can make N pretty big, bigger than anything being able to solve this anymore. But, okay, so there's a quantum algorithm for this. And this is this other paper from 95, Peter Shore. So he thought of this algorithm that solves the DLP in polynomial time. Okay, now remember our big N, we took about two to the small N, and this, this Shore's algorithm only takes small N to the cube. And I mean, if N is 100, 100 cube, it's not that big. And I, I can make an a thousand, but a thousand cube is still not that big. Okay, so there is a good algorithm that assumes the existence of a quantum computer. I mean, as outlandish that might sound, but still, this algorithm in theory breaks the DLP. Okay, so I don't know, maybe in 20 years or in 30 years or 100 years, I don't know personally, but if there is a quantum computer eventually that somehow runs this thing, okay, DLP is broken, classically. So, well, what to do? As I said, let's just try to come up with cryptography for which we don't know a quantum algorithm, okay? Or for which we expect that there won't be a quantum algorithm ever. There are a few candidates. Again, there's the Sioux, lattices, codes, this long word, and isogenies, okay? Now, what I want to tell you about is what is an isogeny and how do I do key exchange with an isogeny, okay? Because I don't know, it's a fancy word, but what does it mean? Okay, and there was this other word that I started with elliptic curve isogenies. So probably I should tell you about what is an elliptic curve or give you a remainder if you've seen this before. So I look at this equation in two variables and two constants. The variables are x and y, my constants are a and b. And the equation is y squared is x cubed plus ax plus b. And now what I want to look at is all the solutions to this equation, all the possible pairs y and x, or x and y. And of course, they're going to look different somehow for the different possible numbers that I can plug in for x and y. And again, you might have guessed it. First of all, we're going to look at it over the decimal numbers, and then later we want to consider this again over our finite field, okay? Because we like 
we like this discreteness. And over R, a simple equation, I just chose some values for A and B, B is set to zero, A is set to one, uh, A is set to zero, B is set to one, the, the solution set looks like this. And actually it extends infinitely far on the right side up and down, okay? So this is just somehow a snapshot of, of what the solution set looks like. But over my finite field, and I chose one with 101 elements, it looks like this set of points, okay? So elliptic curves look, elliptic curves look differently over different fields, but that, that's fine, that's fine. Okay, now, quick reminder of why people like elliptic curves. So there's something called the point addition law. So I can take two points on this curve and I can somehow add them, okay? But this is not really addition in the sense of numbers. There's somehow a law that, that I have to apply. And let me quickly show off how this is done. So how do you add, add two points on this curve? Well, you take these two points, you put a line through it, and then there is a law that says that if I put a line through two points, then it has, this line has to cut the curve in the third point, okay? So I put the line through these two points, it cut the curve in the third point all the way up on the right, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to reflect the point down on the x-axis, okay? So I draw this other line, I reflect it down, and then what I define is that other, that other cut, this I define to be the sum of these two points, okay? So, and that works, okay? I can add point, I can subtract point, there will be, be inverses, so this kind of like acts like integers mod n when you only consider addition, okay? Kind of, kind of, it's not really the same. But you can also single out a special point O, like beautiful O, we call the origin, whatever that is, and this origin kind of acts like a zero. So if I add the origin to the point, well, I get the point again. Or if I add the point and it's inverse, I get that point, I get zero, okay? So there's something like a zero. And you can also multiply points, right? I mean, what is multiplication? It's just repeated addition. So in brackets n, this is what I write for point multiplication, just add the point n times to itself, okay? So there's nothing fancy going on here. So you can somehow add points, you can multiply points. That's pretty cool. And if you look closer, you can look at this special set here that are denoted E brackets big N, and these are all the points on the curve such that if I multiply this point by N, it gives me zero, okay? And this set, um, for the mathematically inclined people among us, I will say this is somehow the end torsion of the elliptic curve, whatever it means, but if you're interested, you can look it up. Um, this set kind of acts like additive integers mod n, like two co copies of it, okay? And now this is where the term super singular comes from, one of the definitions. This is not the only definition, but this is one of them. If you look at the elliptic curve, not over the reals, okay, or over which other numbers, but over this finite field, and if you look at the p torsion, the p torsion, then this behaves differently for different types of curves, okay? The p torsion is either empty, and then we call the curve super singular, or it's just one copy of, of integers mod p, and then we call it ordinary, okay? It's not really important to know what that means, it just means that there, there is a distinction for curves somehow that, that's somehow ingrained mathematically deep down there. And because this E n torsion is somehow two copies of, of integers mod n, additive integers mod n, um, I can generate it by taking linear combinations of two points, say P and Q. And these are like the generators we saw earlier, right? But these are now additive generators instead of somehow exponential generators. But it, it, everything behaves kind, of, behaves kind of similar. And now you can, you can use this to do cryptography already if you wanted to, right? It, you, can, you can somehow look at the DLP in that group but there is the problem again that the DLP in there, but there, there is Shor's algorithm again, right? So even if you do cryptography in this group, you run into the same problem. Okay, so we have to do a bit better. We have to search further. And this is where isogenies come on, uh, come into the play. So one way you can think of an isogeny is um, Remember how we found the integers mod n by somehow dividing z by, by all the n multiples. And you can do something similar with an elliptic curve. You can somehow take part of this n torsion 
And you can divide an elliptic curve by this. You can mod it out. And it turns out this is mathematically well defined and it gives you another elliptic curve. Okay. So I take a curve E1, I take a part of my n torsion, I divide elliptic curve E1 by G, and I get another elliptic curve E2. And there's something else that comes along with this construction. And this is what we call the isogeny. This is a map, okay? Along with this construction comes a map from E1 to E2. And this map is what we call an isogeny. So for us now, an isogeny is just a map that takes us from one curve to another curve, okay? And this map is kind of special because it behaves in a nice way and it plays nicely with the structure that's already ingrained on our curve. Namely, I can either add two points on my starting curve and send it through that map to the other curve, or I can take two points on my starting curve, I can send it through the map and add it over there, and it gives me the same thing. Okay, so this net map somehow behaves nicely with point addition. That's pretty nice, just as a side note. So this map is special. So this is, this is just a remainder of what I said. Adding points on E1 and sending the result to E2 is the same as somehow sending points to E2 and adding them there. So this map somehow plays nicely with, with my laws on my elliptic curve. And now I have to make a, a definition. So in mathematics, we call the kernel of a map we call that the set of all the inputs to the map that are sent to zero, okay? And we saw this origin O here that acted like zero. So the kernel of my isogeny, I'm just going to define as all the inputs to the isogeny that are sent to the zero on the other curve, okay? And in written notation, it's the set of all P on E1 such that the map of P is zero. And it turns out that this kernel for, for my isogeny that I started out with somehow recovers this, this part of the end torsion that I used to construct it. Okay, so there are somehow two ways now to, to think of an isogeny. So this is what we started with. We, we considered E1 mod G, and it gave us this map from E1 to E2. But if I start with this map from E1 to E2, we also find the G again. Okay, so somehow there are two ways to represent this map. We can think of a subgroup, this G, or we can think of the map. And ultimately, somehow there is a correspondence between the various subgroups for different n and isogenies that are somehow emanating from a curve. You can think of this like all the hairs on my head, they're going out and then they're going to reach other elliptic curves maybe. And these notions can be used interchangeably. So somehow there is a, there is a correspondence. And again, I can choose different ends, okay? So somehow from, from one curve, I can have many, many outgoing isogenies that are, that are different in a sense. And now the thing is, in practice, we actually want to compute with these maps. So right now, this is just general abstract nonsense. I didn't tell you anything of how to compute with these things. I just told you there are somehow correspondences, but I mean, what does it even mean, right? It's useless if I, if I can't use it in practice. And then there is another thing you can, you can compute these things, there are formulas, people have worked on this, but somehow the cost grows if I, if I, if I enlarge an n. Okay, so really in practice, for, for applications, I want to choose small n, okay? Maybe two or three, that would be pretty good. And now the thing is, it's the super singular curves for which I can somehow control or choose the possible ends very, very easily, okay? So this is the reason why we, we consider super singular curves. And now I can choose my prime to be of this form, and then magically this is going to force two and three being possible, okay? So this, this is the reason why we choose super singular ones. There's some theory which is not interesting for you, but it's just, um, it's important for, 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 for implementation, and there's a way basically for us to, to force the curve to have those isogenies that we like. But there is another important reason, okay? And this is, this is the reason that actually makes it interesting for cryptography. So what I can do is I start with an arbitrary curve. And this, this might not be a super singular one, just any curve. And say I consider all the outgoing two isogenies, if these are possible, for n is 2. So there's going to be 1, 2, and 3. 
And then again, from E1, I can again consider all the outgoing isotonies, and so on and so forth. So what's going to happen here is this is going to generate a graph where the vertices of my graph are elliptic curves and the edges are isogenies. Okay, so somehow in behind the scenes there's this graph hidden. And now it turns out um, that if you do this for a super singular elliptic curve and then I generated this yesterday for you. So this is one possible graph. I can't remember which prime I took, but here you can see um, all the ellipses are elliptic curves and all the edges between them are two isogenies. So this is, this is an example of a super singular two isogeny graph. Okay, this looks pretty wild. Um, so I can do the same for say NS3, if it's possible, or NS5 and so on and so forth. So there are many, many graphs hidden. But why is the super singular graph uh, specific and important? Well, it turns out that somehow the super singular one is connected and it's what we call a Ramanujan graph, okay? And this is, I'm going to explain this in a second. And as a bonus for implementation purposes, it turns out that you can do all your implementation and arithmetic in the finite field with P squared elements. This is nice, okay? So I'm just gonna say that if, if you don't consider super singular elliptic curves and you go along these graphs, then what's going to happen is that somehow this field of definition, what we call it, could grow for you to be able to go further. But that would suck for implementation, okay? But super singular ones is nice. So FP square is enough for us. So this is, this is again, is good for implementation. So somehow magically many, many things happen here that, that are benefiting us. And Again, why, why is it nice that this is a Ramanujan graph? So a Ramanujan graph has certain optimal expansion properties. And this means that if I start from a random point in my graph and I take a random walk with somehow logarithmic, log many steps of the total amount of vertices, then this will, will put me in a very uniform place in that graph, okay? And this is, this is good for cryptography, okay? because you only need to take log many steps to somehow randomize yourself in that graph. And this is, this is what this could look like. So I started at that red ellipsis over there. This was my starting point. And then I, I generated a few random walks and the blue, the blue points are where I got placed. And I mean, this might not prove anything, but it gives you an idea of how somehow uniformly it places me around that graph. Okay, so. It's good for cryptography, but there are other reasons. So super elliptic curves somehow, I can actually compute how many of these curves I will have in my graph. So this is another reason to, to be looking at these things, because if I don't even know how many curves are in my graph, well, I can't really say anything about the security, but at least for super singular ones, I can say they're roughly P over 12 many, okay? And then again, if I choose my P about N bits, well, then I will know that my graph has about two to the n elements. And at least there I can, I can say something about the, the cryptographic strength, right? I can, I can make n big, and then you can say, oh yeah, you have this random graph, you take some n length walks, and then it places you randomly in there, and your whole graph has about two to the l l n elements, and then I can, I can say something about the expected runtime of my algorithms, right? So this is another reason why we want to com consider super singular curves. Because I, I can tell you how many elements are in this graph. Okay, so a quick summary of what we saw, why this is nice. So what you get is somehow a compact representation of an L plus one regular graph. And we saw examples, for example, L is two or L is three. Bigger values are possible, but we don't even care about those because this is what gives us the fastest somehow arithmetic such that um, we can work over FP square this is nice, this keeps our implementation fast. Um, I can tell you how many vertices are in my graph, about p over 12. And again, such that the graph has some mixing properties that are useful for cryptographic applications. So because I, I want to use this ultimately for cryptography. And again, that's what we said, if I choose an n bit prime p, then the graph has about two to the n vertices. So exponentially many vertices. And it turns out that there are some hard problems that I can ask you to solve in this graph that, that don't have good quantum algorithms. 
So one hard problem is this. I take two super single elliptic curves. So I just give you two random curves in this graph and I ask you, find an isogeny path between those of two isogenies or three isogenies, okay? And it turns out somehow that this doesn't have good quantum algorithm. So classically, I mean, the numbers are not super important here, but classically the complexity is P over P, the fourth root of P and the best quantum algorithm is a bit better. But it, I mean, again, it, it, it's not super important what's there. What's important is that there is no polynomial time algorithm compa compared to our DLP that we started with, okay? So if I make this P very large, your quantum computer, your hypothetical quantum computer will probably not solve this, okay? So that's cool. So how do we do key exchange? So I start with a super singular elliptic curve E where I chose my prime, my prime P such that two and three isogenies are possible. And then Alice, earlier remember she chose a random number A, but now Alice will choose a random subgroup big A and she will send E mod A to Bob, okay? This amounts to Alice for, for computing an isogeny. And again, this is a very symmetrical key exchange, except that now Bob won't use the same generator, but Bob will use the three isogenies, okay? So Bob will choose a random subgroup B, and then he will compute E mod B and send this to Alice. And this is the picture. There's Alice, there's Bob. Again, Alice chose A, Bob chooses B. Alice sends E mod A to Bob. Bob sends E mod B to Alice. And then how do they somehow agree on the shared key? Well, the way they are going to agree is they will just mod out by their respective subgroups again. And turns out the elliptic curve that they find is going to be the same for both of them. Okay, so how does that work? Again, let's return to our graph. I, so say Alice and Bob, they agree on the black curve, okay? The black curve on the left side. And then Alice will compute these red steps which correspond to taking a subgroup. So Alice will compute these red steps for her secret subgroup, and she will end up at the red curve in the upper right corner. And Bob will do the same, but now Bob is not in the two graph, but in the three graph. So this is the three graph. And the black curve that they started from in the three graph is down there, and he will also select a random subgroup, compute the secret path, and Bob will end up in a blue curve. And now Alice will send her red curve to Bob, and Bob will send his blue curve to Alice, and then Alice will, will consider the blue curve in the two graph. Okay, so Alice, she starts from the blue curve that she got from Bob, and this is the position in the two graph, and again, she computes that same secret path and ends up in the green curve, which is up there. Bob got the red curve from Alice, so Bob, he has the red curve there, again, computes that path, and then that ends up at the green curve. And it turns out that the green curves here and there, they are the same. And this is going to be the shared key for them. This is SIDH. Okay, this is how you exchange a secret key using this super singular isogeny graph. And that's somehow the whole magic. And again, let's compare these two things a bit, the DLP-based one and the SIDH one. So we had the square. We Alice and Bob started in the upper left corner and again ended up in the lower right corner. And now SIDH looks very similar, okay? So Alice and Bob start with this common curve E in the upper left corner. Again, Alice computes only the horizontal arrows because she knows her secret group big A. Bob only computes the vertical arrows because only he knows his secret group big B. And again, they both end up in the lower right corner where they, they find a shared key. But now in this case, the shared key is not this element G to the AB, but an elliptic curve. But again, there is a mathematical way somehow to attach a unique number to it. So it's a solved problem to somehow actually make some bytes out of this. And yeah, that's SIDH. That's, that's everything. This is a nice example of a post-quantum, somehow cryptography scheme that, that we have today. And now let me finish with a quick conclusion. So I, I showed you the Sue. There are several candidates somehow for post-quantum cryptography. And among of them 
are some schemes based on supersimilar elliptic curve isogenies. And we've seen that we know some hard problems involving these isogenies that are somehow hard for com quantum computers, which makes this um, one possible scheme for somehow a quantum computer world, okay? And probably I should say that we don't envision a world here where, where users like me or you are in possession of quantum computers. Probably what we, we think about is somehow that state actors are in possession of quantum computers, right? So this is even more important for us to be looking into these things. And what we saw was somehow to be perform a Diffie-Hellman-like key exchange using these isogenies. But, and this is what I didn't tell you about in this talk, there are also schemes for signatures based on isogenies. There is a scheme for key encapsulation based on isogenies. So, so there are other possible candidates for, for other somehow cryptographic building blocks based on isogenies and these hard problems. And if you're super interested about this, you can either ask me or come to our assembly. And if you like reading somehow scientific papers, um, papers about isogenies and cryptography in general, you can find this on the ePrint archive. Okay, so this is a web page where people post preprints about their papers, and there's a huge collection about among of them isogeny papers. So if you're interested in this, this this is somehow the place to 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 research. Okay, and um, with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, is there any question? Um, okay, I got the signal angel there doing some Morse code. Yes. Um, can you recommend any literature for the theoretical background? The theoretical background. There are a few papers that are nice. Um, oh, okay, the question again was literature about theoretical background. And yes, there are a few papers that are giving some nice, even theoretically involved um, summaries about the background. And your best bet is to, to go to ePrint and you enter isogenies in the mask of search terms or SIDH and you look at the papers that somehow say maybe a short introduction to isogeny, something like that. I mean, you will find them if you search for them. I, I don't know them from the top of my head, but they are out there for sure. Yeah, and uh, thanks for him. So there is a very recent paper by Craig Costello, also somehow titled The Short Introduction, something like that. Yeah, so this is also maybe a good source for you to look at. Um, yeah. Isogeny is for beginners. Isogeny is for beginners. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Oh, yeah. Um, so you've used elliptic curve as a as an algebraic group, right, mm -hmm. to um, uh, compute these isogeny graphs. So why do you use elliptic curves? What's the properties of elliptic curves as a group? Why do so? Could you use any group to compute these graphs? And could you use these as the basis for your uh, scheme, for your uh, key exchange scheme? OK, so the question was, why use elliptic curves and, and the group structure that they impose to look at isogeny graphs involving elliptic curves and whether I could use maybe other groups? And actually, there's a twofold answer, maybe. So. If I, if I go back, or actually let me go to my backup slide, which gives you SIDH in its full glory, you can see there's some extra information being sent, namely these generators for my group. And actually the same commutative diagram for SIDH, you could in theory compute using a, a, another group as well that has the proper subgroup structure. But the graph that you will find is probably not going to be interesting. Okay, I mean, it's really, really somehow that Richelieu property that, that makes the graph interesting for, for cryptography. But yes, in theory, the SIDH commutative diagram, you, you could also compute for other groups. Yes. Okay. 
Okay. Um, how good are classical algorithms uh, that try to reverse that SIDH problem? Because that will be the bound for how large your keys have to be to be secure. Yes, so the question was how good are classical algorithms? And um, again, I said, I think the runtime for those is squared of P. And this, is, this tells you how big you have to choose P. Yeah. And um, how confident are you that this really is hard for a quantum computer as well? Well, how, how confident am I that this is really hard for quantum computers? So first of all, cryptography is all about confidence, right? So someone proposes a problem, this problem gets cryptanalyzed, and if it's not broken after 40 years, then people will say, oh yeah, I'm pretty, pretty confident this is good. And maybe if the NSA doesn't tell you anything about it, or maybe if they don't have you know, anything on it, then you can also say that, that you're confident in it. But um, yeah, I think this, this is really an answer that, that only time, this, this is a question that only time can answer, right? I mean. Yeah, I have a question from the same line. Yeah. Is it possible to prove that no polynomial time algorithms for the isogenies problems can exist for a quantum computer? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, how do you, how do you prove how do you prove that no algorithm exists? This this is, brings us brings us into territories like uh, I don't know. Yeah, no. <laughs> let's let's not do that. Um, microphone one. Um, yeah. It, Good, good talk, by the way. Um, the last slide, you say that uh, this, this uh, is hard mm -hmm. for a quantum, but uh, that can't be true because we don't even know if uh, any algorithm is hard for classic computers, right? So, it's, so I'm guessing you're saying that intuitively they're, they're, it, it feels hard, yes. um, which you know, is the same intuition we, we might have about like factoring and exactly. so on. Um, so uh, you mentioned there's multiple candidates for post-quantum cryptography, and they all intuitively feel hard somehow. Uh, do you do you know if uh, you know this specific candidate? You know, is, would this be your horse in a race? Like, is there anything about this specific um, uh, way that you think would be the best fit for post-quantum cryptography? Okay, so y your opinion is very valid. Of course, we don't know if it's hard, right? This this again connects back to the other questions. How, how do you trust something like that? Again, people do cryptanalysis for 40 years or whatever, and then you say, well, no one found anything, it's probably hard. Right, but, but it hasn't you, been exactly, 40 you, years you for, cannot, for exactly, this. Exactly, you cannot say that. It, it, these things are relatively new. And personally, I'm not gonna, I don't know, believe in any of these things until some time passes. So my, my reason for looking into these things really is more somehow a mathematical curiosity because I think these things are beautiful. And somehow the cryptography that, that arises from it is more of a side effect for me personally. So I'm not gonna put out any any somehow, you know, guesses on which which of these things is actually gonna win the PQ race or whatever. Yeah. Hi. Um you showed or said you think it's hard for the classical way and for the quantum cryptography way. Mm -hmm. I think I just read a paper like last year about um, a combined way doing classical and um, quantum cryptography combined, which outperforms either one of those ways. Do you think this could also be a, a can be relevant or um, yeah, make this one way um, yeah, put in computable in polynomial time? So, so are you talking about an algorithm that somehow combines a classical step and a quantum step to yes. break this? Yeah, well, I mean, most algorithms somehow that we say use a quantum computer involve a classical part anyways. I mean, if you think about Shor's algorithm, there's a classical part and a, a quantum computer part. So I'm not sure which algorithm you read about, but I'm sure that somehow all the quantum algorithms involve a classical part implicitly anyways. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, can you please name the mentioned contestants in the NIST challenge based on isogenies? Uh, so there is, there is Psyche, I believe. 
super singular isogeny key encapsulation, but I actually, I don't really follow the NIST con, um, thing closely, so I, I actually couldn't even name all the names that are involved in it, but you can look it up on the NIST website, and I believe somewhere there is also a classification of the contenders in into the zoo, so they will tell you which contenders are based on lattices and which, which contenders are based on codes and which ones are somehow based on isogenies. But off the top of my head, I actually I, I, I don't even know. No, sorry. <laughs> hey, microphone one. Um, so uh, if I got everything correctly, those um, isogenies are uh, group homomorphisms between the elept el um, elliptic curve and the factor group of the elliptic curve by G, mm -hmm. and which has kernel G again. Yes. And uh, well, you said that finding the iso uh, isogeny path in the graph is rather difficult, but uh, wouldn't the real difficulty rather be finding the subgroups G? because a uh, group homomorphism between the elliptic curve and the factor group with kernel G is simply the canonical projection. Exactly. So I see you are mathematically trained, which is yeah. very nice. <laughs> and I, I appreciate math, that. Yeah. This is great. And I am very happy about that. And yeah, if you look at this slide, actually, uh -huh. so the secrets are these alphas and betas, which somehow determine the subgroup. And yes, so finding the isogeny path is equivalent to finding the alpha somehow that generates this group. And as you said correctly, finding the isogeny path is somehow finding, finding this group. But yeah. you, it's just somehow restating the problem, but it's still hard somehow to find this yeah. subgroup. Yeah. All but right, thanks. Thank you, very cool. Uh, microphone two. Okay, yeah, thank you for the great talk. So um, can you play this game a little bit further? I mean, can you choose higher dimensional abelian varieties to uh, make it even more secure, or is it just absolutely inaccessible? I mean, from the computation perspective, like the choice of field of definition is difficult, for example, so. Okay, so the question was on whether you can use higher dimensional abelian varieties, and maybe for the people who don't know what that means, somehow you can attach a dimension to these things in elliptic curves, somehow have a dimension one attached to them, and the question one was, can you somehow look at dimension two or dimension three or higher, and actually, back in the days when people were thinking about the DLP problem on, on the points of elliptic curves that I mentioned briefly, people had the idea of maybe using dimension two or dimension three, but it turns out somehow that this DLP problem actually at some point gets easier in higher dimension, okay? So, so classically, if you look at the DLP, you somehow want to stay at dimension two, but now what you can do, of course, is you can look at isogenies between dimension two or dimension three ones, and actually the problem that arises there, and this makes elliptic curves very special, is that we can compute isogenies rather efficiently for elliptic curves because of Velu's formulas, okay? So somehow this gives us a very direct means of computing these, but it actually gets hard as the dimension grows. For example, for dimension two already, the only isogenies that I somehow am able to efficiently compute are two and three isogenies. So there are some packages out there that can compute higher ones, but only if my prime is very small. And for dimension three and higher, it gets even harder, okay? And then there is another thing that comes into play. So dimension two varieties, somehow, they all arise from what we call hyperelliptic curves. But if you look at dimension threes and higher, then somehow, sometimes you land at the point in your graph that does not come from a hyperelliptic curve anymore. So there is another complication. So, I mean, I had a friend who was looking into genus two, Isogenies, and it's possible to do there, but I, I don't know. I think personally, this is more of a toy than than something that's that's good in practice. Yeah. Yes. Can you use uh, this scheme to implement a fully homomorphic encryption scheme, or is it already? Oh. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> no. Yeah. No. Fully homomorphic encryption is somehow a pipe dream. But, I mean, sometimes it's possible. So the idea is somehow that you can um, add ciphertexts and get the sum of the ciphertexts and have a second somehow operation. Namely, you should be able to multiply ciphertexts and get the multiplication of those ciphertexts. But we didn't even talk about encryption. Okay, so. Yeah. 
Another question, is there any crypto primitive used in the isogeny approach that cannot be stark reduced to finding a hidden subgroup in an abelian group? Uh, could you repeat the question, please? Um, is there any crypto primitive used in the isogeny approach that cannot be stark reduced to finding a hidden subgroup in an abelian group? Okay, so this, uh, I think, this question tries to connect back to somehow maybe the hidden shift problem or the hidden subgroup problem and Cooperberg's algorithm, but I think I'm, I'm not able to answer that question now without talking to the person that actually asked it, because it's a bit vague, so I'm sorry about that. How do you send an elliptic curve over the wire? <laughs> Um, yeah, maybe I should answer that actually. So we saw the parameterization of the curve that had these, um, these coefficients big A and big B, but what I didn't tell you is that to an elliptic curve, you can actually attach what we call an invariant in mathematics. And for an elliptic curve, this is a J, it's, it's called a J invariant. It's a single integer, which somehow um, determines this elliptic curve uniquely. So if I want to send an elliptic curve, I can simply send you its chain variant, and if you know the field of definition, you're going to be able to somehow recompute it just from the single value. So it's actually quite a compact representation, which makes this also interesting. This isn't all. Yeah. I get this is all. Thank you. Thank you.